Yeah, I, I was. Did you see that as well? No, I didn't. I would have been shouting out to Janet. Did you hear that? <laughs> no, I sent the minute I saw it, I sent it to her uh -huh. email. Yeah, I'm yeah. reading it right now. Uh, <laughs> send it to me. Okay. We're going to listen to her. Yeah, show. Rochelle's first. first. <laughs> you know what they, how they tell um, teachers um, don't pass papers out nope. because then everybody will read yes. them. Right. Yeah. 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 Or fill out those things well, I at the end. You. I want to read it. You always fill out the end. And you know what I think is the greater shame? 90% don't have that. Right. Out of the 10% that do have the complete, right. how many are reading it? Right. Yeah. How many are into it? How right. many Bibles sit on the shelves all week long? That's his love letter to us. Why do you leave a love letter? I'm off. I didn't even think to turn me on. <laughs> Okay, we, we can edit this part out anyway because it wasn't where I was going tonight, but, but I, I am I'm often disappointed for people because they have needs and they have hurts and they're complaining and they have sores, you know, and, and, and I get that, but they have something within their reach to help, and yet they leave it sitting on the shelf. And I just think, you know, we, we need to translate it, we need to get it out, but we also need to encourage people, open, read it, let it get into your heart, into your mind. You know, God says, meditate, day and night, night and day, so. But like I say, that isn't what I was here for tonight. And in this parasha, if you've read it, if you've been reading it for the week, you know there is so much, so good. I mean, the whole word of God is good, but... I would like to just park here for like six weeks, eight weeks, and just pick a different topic each week out of just this. So I had to just come, you know, bring it down, and I hope what, I, what the Lord put on my heart is what will bless you. But last week we did look at God creating. We had a bird's eye view of Bereshit, Genesis. We saw the majesty of creation. We saw the triunity of our God. We saw the authority. In the beginning, God. No question, no argument, fact. And we got that little overview of the Torah and the book of Revelation. From the beginning to the end, the season of our joy is not ending. And if we stay in the word, we stay in the joy. If your joy is missing, it's because you're not in the word. It, uh, you can't stay down if you're in the word. You just can't. And we saw from all of this, the authoritative word of God, that gives God a right to tell us. It's not for us to tell him what we think or how it should be. It gives him the right. He is the author. He is the creator. And we're going to pick up from there. <laughs> and I'm just going to say thank you for flying with us. Thank you for coming aboard the Pearl of the Air Orient. <laughs> I trust you're all tucked comfortably into your oyster, and as we go through the duration of our flight, you'll have a good time. And you thought pearls were only found under the water. <laughs> but we are flying over, and we are flying so fast. We've flown over Adam and Eve. We've flown, flown over the first sin and the consequences of it, the first murder and the consequences of that. We've flown completely over the worldwide flood. And the consequence of sin, disobedience to God's word, we've bypassed Enoch. And boy, could he tell us about flying. Yes. He took a flight that I want to take and yes. will one day, friends. And Methuselah, Methuselah, he lived 969 years. What would you have to tell us? Can you imagine sitting down at Methuselah's feet? Great, 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 great granddaddy, what was it like when you were a boy? <laughs> We're just flying no over. <laughs> there, was, there was no traffic. There was no traffic. <laughs> no pollution. <laughs> there was a lot that was not there yeah. then. But what, I mean, my goodness, and we're just flying over. Because what we have done in 11 chapters is we have covered nothing short of 2,000 years. Wow. 
2,000 years, and it's been crammed in a what, a few weeks? <laughs> That's why I'm so frustrated, because there's so much here, I just want to stop and park and take and drink it in. But we are going to slow down a little bit. You'll be happy to know we're going to let you have a little better view out the window instead of watching it just fly by. <laughs> because from chapters 12 to chapter 50, we're only going to cover about 350 to 400 years. So if we've already done 2,000, you can see we're slowing it down a bit. And we're even going to land a few times. So we'll give you some trips. We'll, we'll give you some pit stops. We'll give you some landings. Tonight we're going to start with what a third of the book of Genesis deals with. A third of the book. We've got 50 chapters, so you do the math, but about a third of it. Anyone know what it's about? Yes. yes. Avram. Abraham. Avram. 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 Abram. We have more details about Avram than we have of the origin of the universe. And look what we did with the origin of the universe. <laughs> but there's a key change here, and Avram is a key also. A key change with him, because the first 11 chapters are really all about the plans of man. We've got from Adam all the way through the Tower of Babel, we've got the plans of man. Chapter 12 on, we're going to see it's all about the plans of God. We've got a marked change here. God promised Abram a land. Not quite yet. Not quite yet. It's not promised in chapter 12. That's going to be a surprise to some of you who think, wait a minute, but go read it and you'll realize it's not quite promised. He does promise him a nation and a blessing mm -hmm. in chapter 12. And to just put it in that perspective of time, we're about 350 years, if you want to be exact from those who think they know and may be right, we've got 352 years mm -hmm. since the flood to offer. Wow. We've got the third beginning of our human race in essence. We had the beginning with Adam. Then we had the beginning again with Noah when he came out of the ark. And now we're going to have the beginning of the race that I'm going to call it the chosen nation of Israel because that's what's going to come through Abram. So that's where we are. We're starting a new way to look and a new perspective. And remember now we're looking at God's plans. I always say that we are the first nation. You know the first nation mm -hmm. people? We're, we're the First Nation. Okay, okay. I don't know what I'll do with Chapter 11 if I claim that, but I know what you're saying. <laughs> because at the end of Chapter 11, you've got 70 what become nations go out. So we can say we're the first one with focus. Yeah. Okay, I liked that. Abram's mentioned 312 times in 272 verses in the Bible. So he's talked about, talked about, talked about. He's in 16 of our original covenant books, and he's in 11 of our Brit Hashanah covenant books. And one quote, I quote one that is a student of Avram, and he said he is arguably the most famous man of the Old Covenant. He says Old Testament, but I'm helping his words out here. <laughs> and certainly one of the most influential men in history. And as you stop to think about it, you'll see why he said that. But I'm just going to tell you what our scripture says right now, and I love it. Avram is described as a friend of God. God. Yes. I love it. Yes. Three different times. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land from your people Israel and give it to the descendants of your friend, Abraham, forever? I always have to look at Janet when I say forever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeshahu Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 8. But you, Israel, my servant Yaakov, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. And finally, in the Bracha, John James chapter 2 and verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled which says, And Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Hmm. I love that description. Well, we all know the value of having friends in high places, do we not? Avram <laughs> <laughs> had a friend in the highest place. Yes. But there's another Avraham that lived. Avraham, 
and we call him Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. He received in his presidency a request for a pardon from a man who had deserted the army. And when he was told about this man, he was told that this man has no friends. And when Lincoln heard that, he said, then I will be his friend. Mm -hmm. And he pardoned him. Right. Friends in high places. Mm -hmm. We have many men and women in the Bible that are famous for many different things. We've got Abram and his being called friend. And we see Abram and we remember, and rightfully so, his faith. He was a man of faith. We see Moshe and we think lawgiver. Yeshua, Joshua, general. David, king. Eliyahu, Elijah, prophet. But one thing they had in common is they were people of faith. They had a faith in God. And they could also be called friends of God. I think Abraham just kind of scooped the market there, but they all could be called friends of God. And you might be thinking, well, what about me? Where am I at? Well, if you know Abram's God, then you can be a friend of God also. Mm -hmm. And if you think, but wait a minute, I don't have his kind of faith. Mm -hmm. Well, God can build that faith mm -hmm. in you. Amen. This is a goal to aim for. You think, well, I don't have much faith. And I'll think, ah, you don't realize how much faith you have. How many of you came in here tonight, looked at that chair, examined it, shook it, and <laughs> tested it out, and, 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 and real gingerly <laughs> sat down? <laughs> we act in faith all the time without realizing it. You buy a ticket for a sporting <clears throat> event. You buy a ticket to go on a plane, to go flying. I didn't make you buy a ticket tonight, but you're flying with me. <laughs> you plan a weekend on an outdoor event, and you'll listen to that weather report. Then you'll do all of these things. None of that's out of the ordinary. Yet there's ticket scandals. Mm -hmm. There's airplane crashes. Mm -hmm. And how many know it could rain on your parade? <laughs> but we still have faith, don't we? And we act in that faith. So even if you think, well, I don't have much faith. Oh, what God can do with a little. Mm -hmm. Because it's God. Amen. Amen. I love spending all of them. I see him as a friend of God. I see him for his faith. I see him as father. We often see him and think of him in that capacity, mm -hmm. but I also see him as a follower. He was a follower of Jehovah, a follower of mm -hmm. God. So if you want to hang something and remember it, there's your four F's. Friend, faith, father, and follower. And even though I'm not going to hope to be a father, <laughs> I can still hope to be a leader in that sense. Until Abram, and really through his time, we still don't have Jews and Gentiles. We really have a race of people. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have differences that are in there, mm -hmm. but Abram is referred to, and the correct way to say it from our Hebrew is he's our man. That means that he came from Padan Aram. Padan is field, and Aram was the name of a person. He mm -hmm. came from the field of Aram. And this was in the Mesopotamian area. It was uh, also near what's known as Haran. His brother's name was Haran, mm -hmm. so that's no surprise. But the east area of the upper Euphrates Valley is the area where he came from. And again, at this point in time, you don't have what we call the Jews. You have Abram given a new title, and it's called Hebrew, which means crossed over. He crossed over the Euphrates, literally, but he also crossed over from idolatry into worshiping the one true and living God. And he came on his journey. And as we come down, the distinctions will begin to come. After Avram as the Hebrew, we'll have his son Yitzhak, Isaac as the Israelite. The Israelis come from that. And as we go down the next generation to Yaakov, Jacob, Jacob has 12 sons, so we're into the great-grandchild mm -hmm. level. And Judah, the tribe of Judah, is where the name Jew first really came from. But it does become synonymous with all of the 12 tribes as we move down through the time of history. So that just gives you a little bit of where we're going. 
But what's interesting and what we get out of this portion that we're reading and studying right now is that God is going to raise up the nation of Israel. And I have to say it's definitely the first nation we see God interact with. I mean, hands down, we can say that for sure. God's going to raise up the nation of Israel for four reasons. One, he's going to reveal the true God in the midst of idolatry. Two, he's going to illustrate the blessedness of serving that true God. Thirdly, he's going to receive, or we're going to receive and preserve the divine revelations that are going to come through the, the, the chosen nation. And lastly, the nation was to be the channel for the Messiah to come. So Israel's raised up for a very important reason. The purpose he chose Avram, chose to reveal himself to Avram, is God's sovereignty. Mm -hmm. He chose Avram. But what he received out of Avram is one who wanted to be a follower, who would act in his faith, who would be um, one who would listen to his God. And God interacting with Avram at this time chooses to use the name Yehovah. We've seen Elohim, the strong one, who is faithful, and now again we're seeing Jehovah, the eternal one, who reveals himself. And very often, almost always, I think, in scripture, when God's interacting in a personal way, he uses the name Jehovah. So we see that especially in this portion also. It was Elohim that spoke to Noah after the flood. It was Elohim when they set up, set up the human government, when God gave his rainbow, which is his signature, is really a part of him. I've brought that up before. But now through Avram's seed, God's going to act in a very special relationship with man. And here again, we see that change from the plans of man to the plans of God. And it's very interesting that when Stephen in the Brachadashah, in Acts chapter 7, verses 2 to 4, when he talks about this time, and he quotes our beginning verses in chapter 1 of verse 12, to go, go out of this, out of your country, go to the land that I'll show you, Stephen quotes that, gives a direct quote to it, and he calls Jehovah there the God of glory. And I love that, because my little piano brain went back to Bereshit. It went back to our study. When we looked at God created the heavens and the earth, we saw that Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. We saw that that glory is Yeshua. It's God, He in one. The God of glory, the heavens declaring Hebrews, it tells us that God is revealed in the sun. It's, it's really as if God with skin on is the one we call the sun. Now, let me take you to uh, Psalm 29 and verse 3. Tehillim 29 verse 3 it says, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. Mm -hmm. The God of glory thunders. Same name mm -hmm. that Stephen gave. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. As you read through that psalm, that Tehillim, you come down to verses 10 and 11 that says, The Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. When is that? Uh, yeah, when is that? Well, I'll tell you when. <laughs> because by the consternation on Janet's face, you know it hasn't happened for our people yet. <laughs> but that is talking to the millennium. That's the millennial reign. When Yeshua sits as king on throne on earth and the world will have that shalom. So when we see the title God of glory, we see it tied in with Jehovah. We see it here with the king sitting on his throne forever. We are talking messianic. We are talking of uh, the millennial reign, which is the hope of Israel. The hope of Israel is Mashiach and his reigning kingdom. And we know that the children were always looking for the kingdom. They asked Yeshua repeatedly, are you going to set up the kingdom now? They were looking for it, looking for it, looking for it. So when we see that title, God of glory, king of glory, we are seeing a messianic title. And we know that God is speaking to the father. Avram is called the father 
of the kingdom people. Mm -hmm. This is what God was promising. It's not just that he was going to make them a nation and the original timing here. It was that he was raising Israel up to be a kingdom. Mm -hmm. That kingdom, their king, is Messiah, mm -hmm. Yeshua. And that will be seen in the future in the way they thought, well, Yeshua couldn't have been our Messiah because he didn't come as king. He didn't set up the kingdom. He didn't come with that power and authority. He didn't break the Romans' control over us. But they weren't listening to God and his timing and what he said because he clearly told prophetically over and over and over that Mashiach would come and be a sacrifice, would come lowly riding on a donkey, would come to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and yes, would be the King of glory who will come and sit on David's throne, and that will be what we see. So in this Abrahamic covenant that we're just starting, just scraping the surface in, in chapter 12, verse 1, this go that's beginning here, we won't see it completely, fully fulfilled, until we get all the way to the millennial reign. Mm -hmm. That is yet future. But this Abrahamic covenant is very interesting because it is unconditional. And I don't know if you're familiar, there's eight covenants in scripture. This is just one of them. Uh, five are unconditional, and this being one, an unconditional means it was not dependent on the people. It wasn't God saying, if you do, I will, and meeting part way. God is simply saying, I will. So when God says it, amen. amen. Put a period there. Yeah. <laughs> Very good, because God will do it. It may not be in the way and the time you think and expect, and that is part of our problem for our children of Israel. It's not in the way and the time that they expected, but God is faithful. Remember, Abram had faith in God, and he could because God is faithful. So verse 1, and I'm not going to go through the whole parasha verse by verse in this kind of depth because obviously <laughs> we have a clock. <laughs> but in verse 1 when he says, Go, God commanded, and very often when he commands, he gives reason enough for us to understand. He's not just saying that, that you've got to do without understanding, without your mind. But very often, he accompanies his commands with promises. And those promises are either expressed or understood. And here, they're very clear because in verse 2, after he, he tells Abram to go, he, he, um, we have, and I will. Mm -hmm. God tells what he's going to do. So Abram is supposed to get out of his country. He's supposed to go from his kindred, his relatives. He's supposed to leave his father's house. Mm -hmm. it means get away from the family. Leave the family. You might think, oh, hey, that's me. But wait and see what God's reasoning and what, what, this, what all this involves. Because God doesn't tell him, go out, go into the desert, live all by yourself, never talk to another human being again. I'm isolating you. No. It's not what he said. Now, he didn't tell him even where he was going to send him. He just told him to go. And Avram's obedience is going without asking, where's the map? You know, he just simply followed. But God said, you go, and I will. I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. You know how he blesses Avram? With his fellowship. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine how sweet the time was as Abram's walking day after day after day and his fellowship is with God, with Jehovah. Do you know we have that same opportunity? Mm -hmm. But how many of us aren't tuned in and hearing and are missing? God will make up for anything you think you lose. Mm -hmm. For him, he'll you know, more than make up. You won't feel a lack, I can promise you. And God even told Adam, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make you a new head of a house. And in this unconditional covenant, God's sovereign purpose, that he fulfilled through Abram, we see his program for Israel. We see eventually it is to bring Messiah, the Savior, for all. But it would come through Israel. And again, this covenant rests on God's faithfulness. I am so thankful for that because 
forgive me, but people, we mess up. We blow it. We let down all the time. We're, we don't stay true like we should. But God said it's on my faithfulness, not on human faithfulness, and it's not on human ability. And all I can say to that is praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So let's look at seven parts of this covenant very quickly. One, I've already said, I'll make you a great nation. When he said it to Avram, he meant it earthly, and he meant it spiritually. We'll see it in both ways as we go through Scripture. He, number two, second part to the covenant, he said, I will bless you. The blessings are temporary that we see. Chapter 13, verses 14 through 17, especially deal with the temporal blessings. But when we get to chapter 15 and verse 6, we see God speaking to him spiritually. We see that it wasn't just God promising a large family, that he's promising a seed, and that seed we're going to see is specific. And we're going to tie it in eventually, well, very quickly with Galatians. So I'll bring that out in a moment. Third point of our covenant. He said, I will make your name great. And again, Auburn probably is one of the greatest names among the peoples today. We Jewish people honor his name. The Christians honor his name. Even the Muslims yes. honor his name. He probably is one of the most honored on the face of this earth. And fourth part of the, the covenant, God said, you shall be a blessing. You know, in the Hebrew, it's literally more like a command. Be a blessing. Mm -hmm. Avram, go out. Be a blessing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it through you, but be a blessing. Mm -hmm. I, I just find that interesting. And the blessing of Avraham does come and is felt, is more than felt, is absorbed by every believer. And here's where I'll take us real quickly to Galatians. Go, go with me to Galatians chapter 3. And I forgot to bring out another psalm for you that shows that that was a messianic title, but I think I got my point across. If you want it for later though, and I just erased it, look up at Psalm 24, I think it was. Uh, yes, Psalm 24, verses 7 to 10, also deal with the King of Glory, God of Glory. I forgot to bring that up. But Galatians 3, I want to start real quickly with verse 8 first. In, let me tell you in 3, 6, we've got the quote that Abram believed God. It was reckoned to him for righteousness. We're talking chapter 15 and verse 6. And lest you have not been through that with me, let me just say very quickly, yes, God showed Abram that he was going to have a large family. The descendants would be innumerable. That's understood. But when does believing that you're going to have lots of babies, and they're going to have lots of babies, and they're going to have lots of babies, <laughs> when does that ever make you declared righteous? No. Absolutely When you're 100 nowhere. years old. It still doesn't make you, it, it makes it miraculous, <laughs> but it doesn't make you righteous. How do we become righteous? We are clothed in the robe of righteous. Messiah's righteousness. Mm -hmm. What Avram saw when God showed him and declared, narrated, explained through the stars, he looked through time and saw the seed that would come from his descendants, the one that we're going to see here in chapter um, 3 and verse 16 in just a moment, the seed being Yeshua Jesus. God showed Avram Yeshua's day, his day of crucifixion, his day of resurrection, him being the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. And Avram looked and said, I believe it, God. And God said, I'll count that to you for righteousness. Mm -hmm. That's what took place there. It wasn't just you're going to have a large family, there's going to be a nation from you. That's true also. So verse 6, we got again that Avram believed and it was counted for righteousness. Verse 8, the scripture, for seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Preach the gospel beforehand to Avram. You see, a lot of people think, well, it just was for the Jewish people. But it wasn't. They were to be the priests to the world. They were to take the message to the world. We're going to talk before I get over about the blessings that the Jewish people had and have, but we're going to see why. But here God's saying it wasn't just for the Jewish people, but through the nation. All the nations will be blessed in you through Abraham. 
So then those who are the faith are blessed with Avram the believer. Now drop down with me to verse 13 and 14. We have Messiah. You may have Christ, but in the Hebrew, the original, the, the word is Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the law. Mm -hmm. We know the law was given to the Jewish people. We understand that. He having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Messiah Yeshua, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. It's the, the conduit is the, the avenue through which the gospel message would go. And it's through the Jewish nation that the Messiah would be. That's what a lot of people miss. And if you think that I'm just making all this up, that's where I want to bring you to verse 16 very quickly, which says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Because in 15.6 we're looking at the seed. Okay? But notice what it says here as we go on in that verse. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one. Mm -hmm. And in your seed... And then lest he leave any doubt, any question mark, anyone wonder, who is he meaning, what's he talking about, we have that is Messiah. Messiah is the seed, singular, that was promised to Abraham, that would come through his line, that Abraham looked and saw and believed and was accounted for him for righteousness. But that blessing would go far beyond Abraham and beyond the Jewish nation. It would go to all who would believe it of any nation. Mm -hmm. That comes out of this covenant. And in this covenant, our last two parts are what everyone famously, I think, knows from verse 3. I'll bless them that bless you, and I'll curse them that curse you. And mm -hmm. literally, it says the despiser of thee. If they despise you, they will receive cursing from God. Now, 5 and 6, those two points, blessing and the cursing, actually, we really see it in action in a great way. It was promised protection for them when they would come into the land, because when they came into the land of Canaan, the land that, that's going to be known as the land of Israel, it was settled already by descendants of the one called Canaan. That's how it got its name. And Canaan, Canaan, was the son of Ham, or Ham, as you say, which is the culture. <laughs> Ham, one of the three sons of Noah. But it was Ham's line that God cursed that line because of Ham's sin. And it was through that line that we have the ungodly line continuing. Mm -hmm. Much like we saw back under Adam, we saw his son Cain, Cain, the Cain. first murderer, yeah. the ungodly line that continued from him. And we saw Seth, God's um, blessing to Adam and Eve after a fall, Abel had been murdered. And we see the godly line continue through there. With Noah, the godly line continued through Shem. The ungodly line continued through Ham. Those are the ones who settled into the land. And if you don't remember when God said, you'll have to root out seven nations out of that land, but I'm casting them out because they are so evil. And he said it'll be in the time when their cup of evil has raised to the top when it's full that I will throw them out of this land and I will give this land to you. Well, that land already was notorious for its wickedness and they were going to need God's protection. And we see that through all the battles that go on. But we also <coughs> see a secondary application and that's to our Jewish nation overall. And when we do see any of the world come against the Jew or come against the nation, we do see that God is faithful to his word. Mm -hmm. We see the decline of many empires after they came against the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. The Greeks overran Palestine. They desecrated the altar in the Jewish temple. And soon it was Rome that took over from the Greeks. When Rome killed Paul and many others destroyed Jerusalem under Titus, Rome fell. Spain was reduced to fifth-rate nation after the Inquisition against the Jews. Poland fell after the pogroms. Hitler's Germany went down into the orgies of anti-Semitism, and Britain lost her empire when she broke her faith with Israel. We see the promise even affect what's called the church, because the church has had dark times when they too have been at enmity with the Jew. And when they persecuted the Jewish people, it's come back on them. And we've seen that them suffer also. 
in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Absolutely fulfilled in Messiah, in Mashiach. Yet we also know that we'll see those those earthly promises. The entirety of the land. Israel's never had all her land. She's got a sliver. She's never had what God's <laughs> promised her. It's coming. But it, yes, it's coming. That's what we're talking about in that millennial reign when God will bless the entire world through the nation of Israel, but she will have all that God has promised. Why? Because God made an unconditional covenant with Avra, and God keeps his word. Just before this chapter, we have the families of earth scattered because of, of the Tower of Babel. All the families are being scattered. They're all going to be reunited wow. in Avram's seat in the sign. What a difference this chapter makes. And God's promise that special land also. So, in this partial, we've got another great promise of the Messiah. It's, it was in chapter 3, it's, it's many places before chapter 12 also, but it's repeated again and again and again we see the promise of Messiah. But I want to bring you a, a little more of what's so interesting with Avram. It's in this parsha that we also get his name changed. He's going to go from Avram to Avraham. Okay, and everybody says, oh, I know what that means. He goes from exalted father to the father of a multitude. And I'll say, really? <laughs> really? Let's look at the Hebrew, <laughs> okay? Because <laughs> I've got a problem with that. I, I think I finally understand how they got there in my research, but when we look at the words, we're looking at the, the uh, consonant sounds, because remember, there's no vowels. So Avram, we have the B, the bait, we have the resh, and we have the mem. Okay, we have three letters, the B and R and the M in our English is what we're seeing. And what God does is in the middle of that, he puts the A, hey, the H. Well, because it's tied in with the bait, yeah. And, and, but yes, you're right. I should have brought out the olive <laughs> because it is right there for the beginning. But the word A, A, B, or A, V, really, in, is the R word for father. And Avram is father, okay? When we're saying Abba, we're saying daddy, we're saying father, you know. Okay, so... God makes this name change, okay? When God changes the name of a person, there's a good reason. <laughs> there's a very good reason. So, the Hebrew doesn't support that he goes to become, I mean, he, it definitely I, I see the exalted father from uh, Ab being father and Ram is high or it's senior as in a senior position. So, okay, I can get that part. But when we have Avraham, if we had father of a multitude, it should be Ab Hamon, because Hamon is a word for multitude or for a crowd, for people, okay? Now, we don't call him Ab Hamon. We don't say that. That's not his name. That's not what's done. That's taking the ratio out, and that's, that's just, it's not there. So, let's look at this, and let's see if we can figure out what we've got here, because why did God change his name? If you don't know why, keep listening. <laughs> okay, now we have for the root, we have, and, and yes, I'm going to ignore the of, the olive for a moment, mm -hmm. okay, that we're looking at just in the middle. We're looking at the resh, the R sound, the hey, the H sound that's been added in now, and the yeah. M, the M, M sound mm -hmm. that we have, okay? And in those three, the resh, the hey, and the mem, because Hebrew, I should tell you, often most words come off of a three Hebrew letter. It's called the shorsh, the root, and then we add in the different vowel sounds and we get different words that go from there. But at the time of the biblical Hebrew, that three letter means nothing. It was not a word. It was a, a, a form that we could get. The closest we can get is about a thousand years later in Arabic we get a root that has those three sounds put together and it means more fruitful or plentiful or abundant and it's referring to the goods and the comforts of life so they concluded that it meant to be plentiful. And I think that's where they make a leap because we're talking Arabic, we're talking a thousand years later from when he's named here 
but being plentiful, being abundant, he's having, you know, he's the father of a multitude now. That's the closest I can get. If you find out how they got it, then you tell me. But it doesn't matter what they do. I want to know what God's doing. So if there isn't a compound form out of this, if that isn't what it means, then what does it mean? Because this name change is accompanying our covenant, our Abrahamic covenant. And Messiah is the final result of this covenant. So this is huge, this is important, and I can't believe that God would tie in a name change that makes no sense, mm -hmm. that has no reason and no value. That just doesn't sound like what my God would do. But if he's giving us a sign, it says the Jews require a sign. <laughs> and it gives us signs all the time. We have all the way back in, in Bereshit chapter 1 and 2 that God says it was for signs and for seasons. Okay, so let's see if we look at it again. And we don't go from the root in the way that they did. But if we look at the bait, the reish, and the hay, we're looking, in other words, they, they went on one end and we went on the other end. When you put the bait, the reish, and the hay, the B, the R, and the H yeah. together, now you have a root word that does have a meaning. And the meaning of that root is to cut a covenant. Mm -hmm. Oh, Abrahamic covenant. I think we're on to something. Let's go a little bit deeper. Hey. What does hey mean? Because every letter has a sound, it has a meaning, yeah, it has a numerical value. Value. and it has a numerical value too. I won't bring out the numerical <laughs> tonight because I don't, I, that's another area I get yeah. to go dig in. I hadn't thought, but I like that journey. But hey means behold. And if you've been with me, when God says behold in scripture, he's basically saying, hey, wake up. Don't miss this. It's important. So God, in the middle of this, of this covenant, changing his name and saying, Hello, I've got something important to say to you. And then he also means breath, or a sigh, or look, or reveal, or even a revelation. So in us getting our eyes open, God's revealing to us something that's important here. And the idea of the revealing is this is a great sight, and we're going to point it out. Okay, so we get to the point. So when we take that and we remember that the hay is like the breath, and we know that when God breathed into a dawn, he became a living soul, and we know that we see that represented by the Spirit of God. The Spirit is the breath of God. So now we know that if we're looking at the addition of hay, we're looking at God breathing in, we're looking at the Spirit coming into this in some way, and now we're beginning to get a whole bigger picture. Remember, Jehovah is the one who's talking with Abram. The one who wants this intimate relationship and he's breathing into Abram in a new way now. And he's giving him this new name that means to cut a covenant. And then I think what I see in our parsha, and I see first of all, God promises the Abraham a covenant chapter 12. Chapter 15 we see the cutting of the animals and we know that Abram goes into a deep sleep, and the one who goes through the path in the, the description of a smoking oven and a flaming torch is to be a picture of God, or the Spirit of God, moving through. I should tell you, that's the way they made oaths in those days, is they would have the, the cutting of the animals, and then the two who were making the covenant together would walk through that path together, and it was as, as if they were saying, if either of us break this covenant, what's happened to these animals is what should happen to us. But God walked through it alone because the covenant wasn't dependent on Abram. It wasn't dependent on him breaking it. But we see a cutting there. But I think there's a tiny bit more because before we get to the complete picture, finished, well, we don't see it happen, finished, fulfilled till millennium. But we've got to also go to um, 17. And I think we cut off right after that in our parashah tonight. We have something that happens right there. God 
gives something. And he says it's to be a sign. Let me, uh, let me read it to you. It is chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. The sign is to accompany the covenant that God's giving Avram. The Avrahamic covenant says, This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you, and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. <laughs> And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And I love that God didn't use proper English. He put himself first because it's between him and then Avram and who all Avram's representing. But did you notice what the sign is? The sign is circumcision. And without me getting too... Um, to, uh, what's the word? Graphic. Yeah. Graphic. Mm -hmm. Graphic. Thank you. There's a cutting that takes place. Yes. Yeah. There's a cutting. And that's the cutting that you're talking about that it goes through. So that was the sign. Oh. That was the sign. That is a profound sign for a profound <laughs> new thing. We have a change from Avram to Avraham. It's accompanying the unconditional covenant that speaks to Messiah. It's Messiah who fulfills. It's Messiah who this covenant is about. That's the final result, and now let me give you the final layer. The circumcision of the heart. Yes. Ah. Yes. When God circumcises your heart, you become a new creation. And God Christ. gives you a new name. Yeah. Don't you love it? Amen. You get a new name. Yes. Every time God gives a new name, just go, wow, God. And no, I don't know my new name until yeah, I get home. So we, <laughs> we don't know. But God tells us in Revelation also that we have a new yeah. name. A name that's between God and us. God changed Avram to Abraham. Mm -hmm. He brought it in. He's cutting covenant with him. He's breathing in new spirit, new life, a new work, a new plan. And it's all about Messiah. Mm -hmm. And when we come into Messiah, we get the circumcision of our heart. Is that not rich? And then he we writes, get that he new name. He writes on he our writes, heart. He yes, he does. But I think he writes that name on he our writes, heart. His yes. word is written on our heart. Very good, Bruce. Very good, yes. And on yes. our foreheads, we'll know what that name is. Yeah. And now, also, Jewish... cir circumcision, we know it's actually, you know, in a boy's life, the highest level of plotting factors ever any other time in the life of any human. And when did they get their Hebrew name? On the eighth day. At circumcision. Right. They get their new name. Because they're given their birth name, but they're given their Hebrew name. So it happens and in the physical right. and, and the spiritual and, and the family, oh, yes. the social. <coughs> yes. Well, and it's huge. It's mm -hmm. huge, yes. And just to be clear, yeah. he put Abraham down to sleep, and then that's when the cutting happened? The cutting of the animals, animals yes. was before, before Avram went to sleep. And he's trying to keep the, the vultures off of the yeah. animals, but a great darkness and a horror falls over Avram and he falls asleep. Okay. Because all we can do is in the world in our darkness, we cannot keep covenant. Yeah. But God can, yeah. and God does. And God said this is unconditional, and so God did wow. it to himself. Yes. Then it's, it's a little later that we have the circumcision given, years later actually, but we have the Abrahamic covenant being reaffirmed and completely explained in chapter 17 also. We see it in 12, we see it in 15, we see it in 17. It's, it's absolutely right that they take our parsha and cut it where they do, and I didn't mean to be a pun, but, <laughs> <laughs> but there it is. Yeah, they cut the parsha too. But it fits perfectly because it begins and ends with that Abrahamic covenant, and we have all this richness in between. But I just, I find that so exciting. But now let me ask you, what's the importance of the Abrahamic covenant Apart from the seed being the Messiah, what, why else? Why is this so important? Well, the Jews were the first fruit. They were the first people through Avram to understand a covenant God, a God who is working in a personal relationship and keeping, keeping covenant. And then they were to relay that truth to the world, and through them, Messiah would come to the world. Messiah is Jewish. 
folks. <laughs> he's Jewish. He's not Muslim. He's not Christian. I hear that. Messiah is Jewish. He was born in a Jewish version. <laughs> in the line of David, through, it comes down to Jacob's line, Judah's line, and David. He's Jewish, okay? But you said before that there was Hebrew, then the, the Jewish, and that's where Judaism, the, the Jews Judaism, came from Judaism after. is a whole, whole different, different word. Thing. Judaism yeah. is a Judah, religion. Judah. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Jew Judah. comes from the word Judah. Judah. The line We're Americans Judah. because yeah. we live in America. America. Mm -hmm. Those who are the tribe of Judah, Judah. then actually you say Judah became known as the Jews. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. actually but how when Abraham went into but the land, Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew because he crossed over. over. Okay. Then in, in Isaac's day, we see them being called Israelites. Israelites. Yeah. We have God changed Jacob's name to Israel. We have the Israelites, Israelites continuing there, but then Jacob's son Judah. And as we go down in time through history, the name Jew becomes synonymous for all twelve tribes, and, and it goes from there. Okay, but <laughs> let me ask you. Yes, is the Abrahamic covenant completed then? Messiah's come. We know that I've said that Israel gets earthly promises, but is there nothing left for the Jew now? Is it all done? It's all over? No. Oh, no, not by any means. Again, the earthly land promises have not yet been fulfilled. Israel's never had all the land God's promised her, and she will because Israel said, I'm, I mean, God said, I'm sorry, God said, I'm giving you this land. So Israel will receive her land. God also promised, and you can read it in 2 Samuel, 2 Shmuel, chapter 7. You love Shmuel? Yes, yes. Verses 12 through 16 talk about a throne and a king sitting on that throne in the house of David forever. Forever. There's a lot of fulfillment that's going to come. It's not fulfilled yet. But where we are now, I'll tell you honestly, I think we're in the most sober time right now. Yes. We are in a time that is rapidly becoming very dark. We know that it's going to be a time of Israel's trouble, trouble. called the time of Yaakov's trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble, like they've never seen before. So what should we do? Abandon her? Never. She's rebellious. She's not worshiping her God. She's not being obedient. Off with her. Mm. No. Never. Never. I hear so many say, but it's not our fight. That's over there. Is that the attitude scripture God tells us? Or should we take our example from what Yeshua told his Talmudim what they were to do? Because they were excited. We're going into Jerusalem. Are you going to set up the kingdom now, Lord? They were so excited. I, you know, bless their hearts. I give them an A for it. <laughs> this is what has been building through time that's been promised all the way back with our prophets. It's been promised all the way back in Abraham's time. And it's so ingrained into the Jewish mind when they study and know their scriptures of this coming kingdom and this coming king. And it's, he's supposed to come when they are in need. And they were in need. So it was only natural for them to ask. And if you go to Luke 19 on your own, verse 13 in particular, is Yeshua's answer. But you have the example of a minus there. And without going through a whole long parable, and I just saw the clock, I've got to finish like in two minutes. So let me yes. just say very quickly, Yeshua told his Talmudim what they were to do. He said, do kingdom business mm -hmm. until he comes, wow. until I come. They were to message. be about the, the king's business, business and do kingdom business. What's kingdom business? Get Israel ready for her right. Messiah. To cry out, as Yohanan did, preparing the way in the wilderness for Israel to receive yeah. her Messiah. We're not oh, yeah. to neglect. We're no. not to abandon. We're not to be laissez-faire, whatever that expression is. But notice what he didn't say. He didn't say it wouldn't come. Mm -hmm. He didn't say he wouldn't come. He is promising them. And we stand in that promise today. And we stand in the gap and tell Israel, mm -hmm. your king will come. Mm -hmm. But he's not going to come now in a way that you're expecting. But we've got to be about his business, 
get their hearts prepared. The ones who know ahead will come back with him, but the ones who are living in that time of that trouble, who come to faith, will see and come, and they will be crying out, Baruch HaBam Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So what I'm telling you has absolutely nothing to do with politics. And I'm not here to tell you, yeah, I'm all excited over baby being back on <laughs> yet. But regardless of where you are, it's not about politics. It's not about Israel getting everything right and being the perfect nation and living the right way. It's about God dealing with his people. It's about God keeping the Abrahamic covenant. It's about God being faithful. It's about God dealing with individuals. And he even brings that down to that level because when they go through that time, the ones who live through that tribulation period, there's going to be a judgment at the end of that time, sheep and goats. The sheep go into the kingdom, the goats are cast out, and the, the judgment is on the basis of what they did in relation to Yeshua. That those who gave the cup of cold water, those who went to the prisons, those who did all these things, what, what it's saying is they put their lives on the line to help the Jewish people. Why did they do that? Because they had faith in the God of Israel and they knew that they were to help the Jewish people. They showed their faith by their actions and they will be the ones who will go into the kingdom. And those who did not, because they were not believers, are the ones who are cast out. Why should we care about the Jew? Oh, we've got such a debt that we owe the Jew. What did the Jew give us? Romans 3, 1 through 4 says, what advantage does the Jew have? What benefit of circumcision? Well, it's great in every respect, Paul says. First, they were entrusted with the actual words of God. They had the words of God. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? Far from it. Rather, God must prove to be true, though every person be found a liar. Everyone can lie, and yet God will still be faithful and keep his word. So verse 9 of Romans 3 says, What then? Are, they be are we better than they? Are the Gentiles better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. Verse 21, Now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, the Jewish scriptures. What we know, and what you said in the beginning, how sad that so many in the world only have the Brit Hadashah. They don't have the law and the prophets. And here, Paul's saying, that's the advantage. The Jews have the very words of God. And they've passed them down to us. The Jews gave us our Messiah. The Jews gave us the word of God. And then the question is asked, is God the God of the Jews only? No, he's the God of the Gentiles also. What else belongs to the Jew? And here I, I come fast in the closing. The adoption of sons and daughters, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, the promises, whose are the fathers, Abraham, and from whom is the Messiah, according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. That's what all belongs to the Jewish people. All that I just mentioned, the covenants, the glory of God, all of this. But Romans 8, 17 tells us that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's Jewish, that's Gentile. If you come into the Spirit, if you've got that hay in you, God's with his breath in you, then you are an heir of God and you are joint heir with Mashiach. So you come into Israel's blessings, not to take them away from her, but she gets to share them with you. That's the blessing, the adoption. You become God's child. You come into the seed of Abraham. The glory, the manifestation of God in his glory to the Gentile also. The covenants, what God's promised, you get to share in those blessings. I will give you a people and a land through the seed, the nations of the earth will be blessed. And the nations will be blessed in the, middle, the millennial time. That new covenant that God is talking about, Ezekiel, the prophet, tells us, chapter 37 and verse 14, I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life. I will place you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, has spoken and done it, declares the Lord. And I tell Israel, you're back in the land, but the spirit isn't in you yet, but there will be the day mm -hmm. that that will be.
and hallelujah, what a day that will be. Year me at Jeremiah 31 says the days are coming when I'll make that new covenant with Israel and the house of Judah. Salvation comes of the Jews because the one who came to save us was of the Jews. And we come into all these blessings in faith in the Messiah. The roots of our faith are Jewish. They are heard there. There's just no other way to say, say it. It is a Jewish <laughs> tree. And if you want to be on God's side, then you want to be on the side to help the Jew. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you say everything they do is right, but you help them. You help them by praying for them. You help them by sharing a love for their scriptures, provoking them to jealousy, opening their hearts and minds to say, hey, there is something special here. There is something. And then we'll see Dover in Deuteronomy 32, 43, in Living Action, where it says, Rejoice, O nations. Mm -hmm. Rejoice, O Gentiles, is what that's saying. With his people, he will provide atonement for his land and his people. Hallelujah. God had a master plan that loves the entire world. And the Lord will bring them all. He will save Gentile and Jew alike who come into saving faith with him. And then he says in Zechariah 9 that the jewels of the crown, the Jews come in to be that conduit to take it to the world. That's, no, I know, I'm sorry. I, I, was I love it, I love it. I love it. <laughs> but let me just say it's not negotiable, okay? It's not negotiable. This is the way God ordained it. <laughs> Excuse me. It does not make us hate others, but it makes us love the Jew. Mm -hmm. And in Psalm 122, 6 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Those who, who bless him will prosper. <laughs> See, I'm supposed to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Do kingdom business until he comes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Stand Amen. with this. You can't perfect. Love her. <laughs> I love it. <coughs> Absolutely love it. Need some water? Need some water.